Hey, how's everyone doing out there? Welcome to a Word Hole Media presentation of Major League A Holes in the Hole and Socks Top Thing Therapy Session. I'm Pete. <laughs> I'm Ryan. You are in the hole with Major League A Holes on a thirsty Thursday. I got a I got a bourbon cocktail here. That's a bourbon? Wow. Mm. Bourbon and what? It's called a bourbon Ricky. I it's have no idea what that means. Bourbon, lime juice, and carbonated water. So oh my God, that use. sounds delightful it uh, is and you don't get hung over from it because you're getting rehydrated while you're getting dehydrated you it's keep awesome telling, keep telling yourself that but ah! <laughs> let's see how that works i'm <laughs> drinking a i'm drinking a surly furious ipa mm. uh, again the only good thing that's Delicious. ever come out of minnesota in my opinion uh, yes but yeah we haven't done a thirsty thursday in quite a while so we'll see how this goes i think this is gonna be a fairly short show uh, as yeah. we're kind of in limbo here still before the trade deadline wow Uh, i think as of this evening we are 12 days away by the time this comes out uh, 11 or 10 days away not much has changed we still have one team of the five that we cover that's definitely going to be a buyer we have two that are definitely sellers and two that are in complete limbo that i will get to discuss in my cubs and tigers section uh, after that, I think we're going to throw in our badass of the week again that actually doesn't include Luis Robert for the first time in months, it feels like. So not that he underperformed this week. He just underperformed compared to his typical stuff. So but we'll get to that. So we might as well go ahead and jump into the news. Well, in unceremonious fashion, we are going to open up with some shit you could make up, right, Smitty? I think we should open with some shit we couldn't make up. Um, Our teams, four of the five teams, uh, were part of a record-setting evening on uh, Tuesday night where 10 teams, or 10 games, all scored double-digit runs on both sides, right? I thought it was 11. 11, Oh, it was 11? Okay. Yeah, 11 teams scored 10 runs or more for the first time since 1894. Wow. Although I, I'm a little worried about this because I'm reporting this now on our, on our very highly respected podcast, but this oh inform- yeah, we don't <laughs> want to get this information wrong. This information came from the Twitter account of Bob Nightingale, who <laughs> we oh. have maligned over the years mercilessly. So oh, I did also probably have double check that on MLB. Okay, on I've seen MLB, it reported uh, social media. I saw it reported other places, but I was worried yeah. they got it from Bob. So you never know. But it, uh, we did have firsthand knowledge since many of the games you and I were both watching Tuesday night and yeah. included those totals. So, yeah. So the the let's see, there were I know there were thirty seven runs scored between the Tigers, Cubs, and White Sox. Yet only two of those, only one of those teams actually won their game. Yes. Which is hard to believe. And you uh, threw in that the Giants also scored 11, 11 runs. That's the other thing. Three of our teams score were in games that where the score was 11 to 10, and only one of those teams won that game. So <laughs> that's kind of a maybe a, a ridiculous, yeah! ridiculous microcosm of how this season has gone for it is. us that in the hole. It is. It's, it's a perfect – I think it summed it up perfectly. And like you said, yours was, yours was funnier – or yours was Typically. a better story. <laughs> yours was a, yours was was better. Where it's just one team wins with scoring all those runs. But yeah, we should explain a little bit. I, we were on a text chain message. That may have been really early in the morning. Why are we on texting Wednesday? At, we're texting at like seven in the morning. It's I'm texting you while I'm taking a shit. You know, <laughs> Jesus Christ! I didn't even know that part. TMI. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you I. I think you sent me the no, I sent you the thing where it was 37 runs. You're like, no, it's 48. Like, I like mine better. So. <laughs> yeah, but uh yeah, it was uh it was a crazy night uh in baseball. Um I guess that's a great segue to get into the Giants since they did yeah. score uh a, a win eleven to ten. They also won four to two um due to a game that was a little bit I don't, I'm sure you weren't tuned in, but it was a little bit odd the timing of the rain delay. 
The Giants. You're talking Raiders, Tuesday night in yeah, uh, Monday, Cincinnati. Monday night, Monday night in Cincinnati. Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. Let me let me explain this story. Monday night in Cincinnati, the game ended up suspended in the. Air. Oh, that's right. So they had to finish it on Tuesday, but on, you rarely on, see that anymore where they suspend a game. Maybe, maybe that happens in the rare circumstance that there's a torrential downpour late in the game and they've got another game the next day in the same city. So it's not a problem just to play an inning before right. the game starts. But you don't right. see that very often. It, it was a little curious because it took probably about 10 minutes for the rain to actually start. After oh. they put the tarp on the field. Now it was a torrential, like horrendous, like bad thunderstorms, like we've all been having in the Midwest. So I don't fault. I don't Light. fault for being a rain delay. I'm but guessing they, there was lightning in the area, so they had to evacuate the stands. Is that is that what the initial uh, delay was called for? They didn't say that. Nothing was visual. I think okay. maybe part of it was it was convenient since the Giants had runners on second and third <laughs> with one okay. out in a tied ball game. All right. Uh, for them to get the tarp out on the field with any excuse as soon as possible. Well, don't JD Dave is coming to the plate. I think the umpires are responsible for that. Not the grounds crew. I don't think a rogue, like a rogue grounds crew just runs onto the field. with. They look, the tarp, they look but... no one had any idea. They look like a rogue grounds crew. As far I mean, as I'm concerned. I love I love a conspiracy theory as much as well, anybody, but I, I mean, I'm, this is going to be a bit dubious, even more rogue because during it, they were so, so, I think the grounds crew was so surprised that they had to get the tarp on the field that a grounds crew member ended up under trapped underneath <laughs> the tarp and had to crawl his way out, for God's sake. Uh. Even the grounds crew didn't realize they had to pull the tarp on the field. <laughs> Leave no man behind. That's right. Uh, so what ended up happening on the Tuesday um uh, you know, the, the follow up, the, the follow up on and, and the eighth inning with one out is the Reds escaped with no runs scoring and they went to extra innings. The Giants went on to win four to two. So no harm, no foul. Uh, but, but I think the inning could have been decided with the right. Mo, Mo going right. their way. But so do, mean, they God, a, do they take a, do they take like a half a lightning? <laughs> Do they take a half hour off between games, just like in a in a straight double header? Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay, so, you, so that killed killed the momentum of your triumphant extra innings victory. Oh no! You, you had to wait I, another I, half hour, and then you had to play the next we, game. Then we had to win eleven to ten. Yeah. Oh yeah. So. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> you're but a, then you're having a rough time over there. It's it so, is. It's tough. So then, we, but we, then we, you know, it's looking good, and then we lose three to two last night, and then lost five to one uh, this mm. afternoon. So you know that puts us at a whole two games out of first right now, tied with the Diamondbacks, who look like they were going to be fading away, but are somehow still sticking around. Uh, both teams are trailing the Dodgers. Um, one thing I was looking at the schedule, uh, it's really going to be interesting if things stay the way they are. And I kind of, you know, it's, it's pointing to that. I think I can drop the narrative. I think the giants are for real. I think the giants are going to be buyers. I think they have a legitimate shot at winning this division, not just the wild mm. card, um, especially because they play the Dodgers seven times in their final 10 games. Oh, wow. I mean, if you want to talk about season on the line, it, it, either team's probably going to be within like four games of one another going into those final 10 games. And, and just to make things even more interesting, the two games before they start the first series with the Dodgers are against the Diamondbacks. Wow. Then they play three of the Dodgers or four of the Dodgers, three with the Padres, and then three with the Dodgers to close out the year. So it's, you know, I don't think MLB right now, if, if things uh, it, uh, avoiding any major implosion from any of the teams could have asked for a more that, storybook ending to the yeah. NLS this year. That's going to be a hell of a hell of a couple of weeks right there. Yeah. So. Hopefully. I, uh, I I noticed that. I just wanted to point that out now because I feel like if I didn't do it now, somehow I'd forget. Um, so <laughs> I'm doing it now, way ahead of schedule. Yeah, but do it. It's going to be interesting last week of September into the first week of October this year for my Giants. Um, 
But we're still in July. Let, let's let's figure out what the fuck's going on now before this fucking trade deadline. We're That's getting Otani. We're gonna bring this shit home. We're trading for Otani. He's I've actually tradable. seen that. I've seen that in respectable publications across the country. I've seen that theory thrown out yeah. there. Of course, I've also seen theories where Otani could go to pretty much any of the other twenty nine ball clubs. Yes, yeah, he's baseball, going to the so. Yankees also. Yeah. Uh, he will not go to the Dodgers. I read because Moreno will not trade with the Dodgers because they're in the same town. Sounds All right. Like something Even petty. if they gave him the best <laughs> trade package. I know. I know. I mean, that, it sounds like something petty enough for him to do though. I, 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 I believe find it. Story to be plausible based yeah, on what I, I've known about him. I think you're right. Uh, Sadly so, enough. So that's good. That's good for me. That's good for me. That's good business for me. Bad business for the angels, but that's all they've done for the last what decade and a half. So I'd say 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. It's maybe two decades. So, but um, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I got for the giants this week. Um, it's enjoyable baseball to watch. Yeah. The one, 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 one team, the one, uh, one team in our, you know, of the five that we cover here that is above 500 consistently above 500. Yeah. Like 10 games, I think right now. Yeah. Good work over there. Hey, thanks, man. Well, everything is actually great over over with my Chicago Cubs. I mean, yeah, you had the 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 powerhouse Nationals in, and you yeah. took care of them. I mean, I so mean, it must be real. They won Tuesday night, like as we mentioned, seventeen to three. They won last night, eight to three. Nico hit a grand slam. Oh. Patrick Wisdom hit a hit a home run after growing a mustache. Oh, that 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 always works. That's a big story somehow. Right now is how he grew a mustache, which always makes me laugh. But yeah, uh, yeah. The problem is the Cubs are three and three since the All Star break, and they have had the easiest runway you could imagine into the trade deadline uh, from the All Star break. They had. The Red Sox at home this past weekend, which is a bit daunting, but they had Stroman and Justin Steele going. So you're assuming they're going to win two out of three in that. At least. Ooh, Justin Steele got rocked. That is the problem. Uh, they've also had, as you mentioned, the Washington Nationals in town, at, which should have been a sweep, and it was not. It was close, but not good enough. Uh, you know, Now we've got the Cardinals coming into town, who are a shadow of their former selves, although they have won five five out of six coming out of the break, so they might be a bit more for, formidable than I'm giving them credit for. Uh, that game starts in a little bit here. Uh, actually, in an hour, we might be able to wrap this up, and I might be able to actually watch that entire game. But Wow, I'm excited for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, they travel a mere eight miles to the south side of Chicago to face your White Sox, which should be two wins for the Cubs. I say, no offense, but the Cubs should win those games. Uh, and then they've got the Cardinals again next weekend. So, Especially since they seem to play better in each other's ballparks, too. Yeah. Yeah. It has played it's out weird. That series yeah. has always been that way. It's strange. It's strange. But like I said, they've had the easiest runway to, to make a run before this trade line deadline and make things much simpler for fans and certainly Jed Hoyer to make a, make their decisions on whether Cubs should be buyers or sellers. And they're three and three since the break. So we're basically where we've always been. Uh, it's, it's just a frustrating existence. You know, you're living on small data points, you know, one game here and there, could make all the difference in the direction for the rest of the season, maybe the direction for the next few years. It's ridiculous. As we keep getting inching closer to this deadline, every game becomes that much more important. Yeah. How that decision is going to be made. So I don't, I, I don't believe that, you know, a win next week, you know, here and there will change, turn the tide necessarily, but it would, it's possible that, you know, if they, find themselves just a little bit closer to the division lead. If they, you know, win a series that they weren't expecting, you know, it, it's hard to say, but as they keep inching along here, it just makes that decision more difficult because you're basing it on fewer and fewer data points being the games left before the, for the trade deadline. So. Oh, where, where would you, well, they're like five, they're, I think they're five under 500 yes. right now. 
where but where would you want them to be? Because they're so they're eight out of that's out a of great question, and they're six and a half out of the wild card, so they're actually closer to the wild card, but they're dealing with the Giants and and the diamond yeah wild card yeah i'm not yeah i don't think that's that's realistic i I think the division is even though the math math looks different right now i think the division is is definitely more attainable i you and i talked about the white Sox last week you were joking that they needed to go 17 and oh well i wasn't joking they needed to go like (laughs) at least 15 and two or something that's over that 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 ship has sailed so the the cubs need to play 700 baseball essentially They, they need to be you know, winning every series they're in and they they did not do that immediately against the Red Sox and that that was that was the most frustrating part of it then again they lost only one game to the Nationals but they shouldn't be losing games to the Nationals at this point in the season if they want to make it make it in a positive direction at the at the trade deadline so it's really the you know the players players on the field are letting them letting Jed Hoyer down at this point because he's trying to make that decision, but it, it's layers. I, I was thinking about this today. It, it's really layers of self destruction, right, 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 or self sabotage. Really, the, the right now the team is yeah the team is you know playing at five hundred, which is not good enough. But that that's because of the roster construction and Jed Hoyer confusing activity for accomplishment that I've spoken of many times. And the roster that he's built with the the free agents really built on with a with a dual pronged strategy, hoping they would perform to a point where they could build off of this at the trade deadline. Or if they didn't, they had expiring contracts that they could trade at the at the trade deadline for assets to move forward. And so literally that's by design. And this is kind of, you know, coming coming to fruition much, much to judge chagrin because it's making this decision even more difficult as mediocre as the team's been of course the third layer of all of this has been well documented that jed hoyer's legs has been cut out from underneath them years ago by owner tom ricketts by blaming the pandemic uh, uh basically treating his major market behemoth as a small market club and not taking advantage uh when they could have and not spending the right right amount of money and trade trading away valuable assets as as we've seen. So it's frustrating. It's it's happening on multiple levels. That's that's kind of a larger view. Of course, the real reason the Cubs find themselves in the position they're in right now is they weren't able to draft very well in the second half of the the decade after they were no longer drafting in the top five after their after their tank job. So that's the real cause of all this. So the reasons why we were here are multifold. Uh, it shouldn't be too surprising, I guess, but the, the weirdest thing, like I said, I mean, if they go on some crazy 700 winning percentage from here to the trade deadline in the next 12 days, they will be buyers. And that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. If not, they have to be sellers and we'll see, Unfortunately, players like Cody Bellinger, who's actually seems to be have figured things out after years of frustration in Los Angeles, the, the Cubs actually unlocked what was what was the issue. You know, he he is he is the left-handed hitting behemoth that the that the Cubs really need, and that he's always had the potential to be since his MVP year. We haven't seen, but we only signed him for the one year, and now the Cubs are going to have to make a decision on. Marcus Stroman, of course, is is the other other elephant in the room. Um, I just, if they really, literally, it could go either way to the to the very last day. I think they're deciding they're they're not making a decision. They're not extending him. They're gonna see see how things play out and wait to see what what offers are made towards them for his services. So. <laughs> I feel like I've done this, a similar podcast for the last month or so. There's just Cubs haven't separated themselves in one direction or the other yet. We are, uh, you know, like I said, 12 days away. You and I are only going to be doing one more podcast, I believe, before the trade deadline. That's correct. So next week, maybe I'll have like some, maybe there'll be some real 
a real decision made. Maybe there would be a trade made at that point. Maybe the, the Cubs will have separated themselves record wide, record wise, whether they blow it over the next week or they dominate the next week. Maybe there'll be maybe some like real direction that that we could we could actually talk about. But again, I, we're yeah, you used the phrase they are in the razor's edge last week, and I think they're 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 still right there. But I guess that makes every game really exciting on on multiple levels. So such is the plight of every Cubs fan right now. I mean, I just don't, I mean, from the outside looking in, and I've been saying it all season long, like, I don't even see how they should be buyers. Uh, I don't think this team is for real on any level. I think, well, I, I know you don't. I think... And I think, I think anyone that did, I think you're fooling yourself. I mean, look at the way they've, look at the months they've had, the way they've played. I mean. I'm and, not proposing. I think, I guess this is a little bit deeper, deeper level. I, I think if anything, the Cubs might stand pat rather than selling uh, or make minor moves here and there. Um well, you have to trade anyone who's on a one-year deal if you can get anything for them. I mean, well, no, 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 no. I'm saying if they're going to go for it, they're going to hold on to those players and make and make moves. So, the, oh, oh, I see. What going you're saying. For, going for it isn't isn't trading the farm system away to to you know try to try to make a run. I'm saying just hold on to those players, not maximize those assets for for God. the future. Maximize like them like in the White Sox fan. In the present, well, we're a little bit closer to 500. Uh, you know. But you're eight games out of first against a Cincinnati team that is one of the hottest teams in baseball. Not so much. I mean, they, they split with the Giants. Honestly, I'm not scared of Cincinnati. I'm more scared of the Brewers for long term. And the Brewers have some serious issues as well. So th- that's that's why we're in the conundrum that, that we're in because there's no reason that the Cubs shouldn't be in that mix. Although they haven't, like you said, they have not performed to that level, but you're just going to disagree with me on my optimism. I, I wouldn't even hardly call it optimism, but I, I'm, I'm disagreeing with your, your devout pessimism, I guess. Is, yeah. Is I'll just I'd call it, that. I would call it foolishness at this point. <laughs> All right. Uh, you you've got a right. You've got a you've got a platform to call me a fool. So yeah, I'm not. I, I, I've said foolishness, and I'm saying you're a fool. I'm just saying you're. I know what you're saying. Foolishly, <laughs> and you you one who acts like look, a fool. Well, one who acts like a fool. Um, what I would say is, for one of the like rare times over the 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 years that we've done this together, and it's only it, there's there's been very rare times this happened. You are a hundred percent acting like what I would consider a prototypical Cubs fan right now. I think you are mischaracter. I think you're overemphasizing what I'm trying to say here. Uh, I'm not making a decision yet. I'm not. I'm saying there is a possibility that they can do that. I'm not saying this has to be done. I'm saying in ten, in twelve days, that decision would become much more clear. So you're putting me in a in a corner here before I'm ready to be put into a corner. Okay, baby. before before anyone needs to be put in a corner. No one puts baby in a corner. <laughs> I see what you're doing over there. It's not going to happen. All right, whatever. Why don't you talk about your Tigers? I do appreciate that. that you recognize that I'm not a typical Cubs fan in general. So well, I tried to, but if now I'm... you're <laughs> pushing me the other way. Yeah, well, yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll restore your faith in my non cub non stereotypical Cubs. Well, we'll see how you do next week. <laughs> <laughs> Every one of these fucking podcasts is a test. We've been doing this shit for almost buying, three years. I'm buying a fucking buzzer this week. <laughs> well, let me shift <laughs> swiftly over to my Detroit Tigers. Unless you wanted to beat me, rake me over the coals anymore with the with the Cubs situation. No, but here's a team I'd be a little more optimistic about. Uh, that that's interesting because I. <laughs> That's fascinating, actually, because the Tigers, I am actually more optimistic, even though they're not in a, even close to the same kind of position that, that the Cubs are in. Yet they are closer to winning the division. Well, that's, again, that's that's all circumstantial based on the, on the ridiculously mediocre competition. 
both divisions find themselves. But. Well, well, let me, I don't want to, I don't want to derail your segment. You've already me, derailed it, but that's fine. It's a thirsty but let, Thursday. Uh, but let me, let me just point this out to you. Everything's just reverse for the, for the Tigers. In, 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 if you're just looking at games out, there are five out of the, out of the division, which, you know, six and a half out of the wild card for the Cubs. And they're nine out of the wild card, but eight, <laughs> the Cubs are eight out of the division. So, I love that you're looking at wild card standings for for my teams, but I, I haven't even looked at those. So you should be equally, if not more, optimistic for the Tigers. The 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 huge difference between the two franchises are expectations and essentially resources. Uh, the Tigers are not expected to do anything. I've never expected them to be buyers of the deadline or to be contenders in this division going in named my fantasy baseball team this year, the Motor City Re-Rebuild, because we are entering a, yet another rebuild uh, directly on the heels of El Avila's failed re- rebuild. So the expectations are radically different. So that, that's why my my attitude, maybe, maybe yours is even shaped by that. I... I find the the Tiger situation much more, much easier to deal with. Uh, I, I'd be happy kind of either way with what the what the Tigers might do on on trade deadline day on August first. Interesting, interestingly enough, Scott Harris mentioned during the All Star break that if the Tigers got off to a hot start coming out of the break. They might have to change, you know, their their modus operandi. They, they might have to figure out, you know, maybe we're not sellers. Maybe we can make make a move here that that would make sense to actually propel us towards a a shitty division title. And believe it or not, the Tigers have come out hot in this uh, second half of the season after that the trade. They have. They are now five and two after this afternoon's game, victory in Kansas City. You might say winning a series in Kansas City is should be expected. That's fine. You just got to do it. The cool thing is right out of the break, they actually beat Seattle in a three-game series. They I won know. the series two to one in Seattle. Impressive. Yeah, it, it, that was that was kind of kind of set the tone. I'm hoping it set the tone for the second half here. I mean, question: What's more impressive, going five and two against? The Mariners and uh, wait, Kansas, City. Plays, Kansas City, or going three and three against the Washington Nationals. Yeah. Uh, who who's the other shit team the Cubs played? <laughs> it was Boston. Boston, yeah. What's more impressive? I don't know. Well, the I'm Tigers, excited about the Tigers. That's a thing. The again, I wasn't expecting them to win five out of seven, and they've they've done that all on the road. Not that Seattle is a world beater or anything, but winning on a winning on the West Coast is trouble for AL Central teams in general. Sure is. Like, sure is. So, so that that's been really fun to watch. They they the bats have really come to life. A lot of home runs. Kerry Carpenter had a few home runs. Who's going to show up on our badass of the week nomination? Uh, he did quite well in, in Seattle. Torkelson had a two home run game uh, two nights ago in Kansas City much maligned Torkelson, who I'm going to be the champion of for all the Tigers fans who are calling him a bust already before he's even close to a thousand plate appearances, in his major league career. I just heard a stat the other day. Um, he is the first Tiger since Hank Greenberg, Hall of Fame Hank Greenberg, to have whatever stats he, he – I forget exactly what the stats are, but as a 23-year-old uh, – <laughs> He's essentially trending like Hank Greenberg at this point, and yet Tigers fans are freaking it's not good out enough for it. Tigers fans. Yeah, it's it's annoying. It's mainly annoying radio show callers, so it's not all Tigers fans by any means. But I'm gonna, I'll probably maybe I'm, I'll do a weekly segment about Torkelson somehow, uh, just to assuage the fears that he might be a bust. So it's it's interesting to you know the Tigers have. San Diego coming into town this weekend. Uh, they actually play one game against your San Francisco Giants, a makeup game from earlier in the season. Uh, I forget who the, oh, they play the Angels after that. So those are, 
maybe winnable games. Uh, Angels might not have Otani when they play them then if they're playing them after that. That's a possibility. Uh, you never know, but I, I kind of don't know what to think of the Angels even with Otani because they don't win nearly enough as as they should if you look at the paper. Although they did just sweep the Yankees, I think. so. Yeah, Yankees are, Yankees are like that one year. They just have fucking fallen apart, man. Love it. I love, love it. it. I love it. The question is if if somehow the Tigers do continue this hot streak for the next week or so or uh, 10 days do they become buyers which sounds it just sounds absurd but I think again I kind of mentioned this during my during the cub segment I'm not sure I'd want them to become like crazy buyers I definitely I definitely don't want them to try to you know go after Otani or something like that and just completely gut the farm system that that's absurd. I think more what they could do is kind of kind of stand pat, kind of not trade away really increasing uh, value assets as Michael Lorenzen, who just went another shutout seven innings today. Uh, Eduardo Rodriguez went seven innings yesterday in a victory. Um, though I think I'd it's almost like they should just hold on to those guys. Lorenzen, of course, is on a one-year deal. He purposely, he he explicitly said he came to Detroit in this offseason. He chose to come here because he knew the Tigers organization would make him better. And that was really, really an interesting comment. I, I believe I brought it up on the podcast at the time or around the around the time. That's a ringing endorsement from someone who has no no uh skin in the game other than his own career he he's endorsing the the coaching staff and the training departments of the Detroit Tigers which i have never heard of at least during the Alavila regime um i think it's it speaks <laughs> to you know the faith that that free agent you know just the reputation across the league that AJ Hinch and more importantly for pitchers pitching coach Chris Fetter have in finding ways to make the pitching staff uh, as good as it could possibly be maximizing, maximizing their potential. And we've seen that the the Tigers have been abysmal, but the problem over the last several years has not been the pitching. It's all been on offense. That's where the issues are. Uh, You could, I mean, like I said, they've, they've had set in 2022, they had 17 different starting pitchers. And yet their over staff ERA was not that bad. The the bullpen has been amazing again this year. Uh, we've had 14 starting pitchers in this season alone already. And yet we keep finding ways. We just, the, the problem with the Tigers has been offense. So I kind of would like the Tigers to just, if, if they go on this, uh, you know, have another good week next week, go hold on to those expiring assets and maybe not add. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't want to trade for Josh Donaldson or somebody like that from the Yankees. I heard, I heard suggested who's got crazy numbers this year. I don't know if you've, if you've seen this, but but he's in Yankee stadium too. And that's exactly, that's where the difference is happening. Yeah. He's got like an offensive player from Colorado. Good luck. you're, You're making my argument for me, but, uh, he's got, 15 hits on the year, which is pathetic, but 10 of those are home runs. Yeah. That speaks to the miniature golf course of the, that it seems like every ballpark in, in the AL East is they're all ridiculous to me, but plus he's not a good, he's a dick. Guy. Yeah. yeah I, he's I, not I, a good clubhouse guy. So maybe Josh Donaldson wasn't, wasn't a good, good example, but uh, it's just something I've heard brought up. In no, no, but radio. yeah. I, I, but I, I would rather see them hold on to their pitching staff you know, hope that Lorenzen maybe loves his time in Detroit so much that he just resigns next year. Eduardo Rodriguez even mentioned yesterday that he he's happy in Detroit. You know, that doesn't mean he's going to stay. He's not not going to opt out of his five year deal, which he can after this season. He said he's he's making plenty of money and he's he's happy in Detroit. So he, he's trying to send signals at least to the fans that he's not. He's not ready to jump ship. I, I'm sure Scott Harris and uh, the front office of the Tigers knows more about that, what what the realistic possibilities are. But 
I say hold on to hold on to the staff that is that has done quite well and promote from triple A to find your offense. Because there are plenty of plenty of options that are knocking the shit out of the ball at AAA Toledo right now. The chief among them is Colt Keith, who I think could be called up after af- into August and solve their third base issue. Uh, we could also call up Justin Henry Malloy to help in the outfield or DH or wherever he needs to be. Parker Meadows is another name that you'll, you'll hear a lot of going forward. Uh, oddly enough, brother of Austin Meadows, which makes me a little nervous, but of course we haven't heard of any mental health issues with his younger brother, Parker. So who's also knocking out home runs in Toledo right now. So I, I think the Tigers can solve, can solve some of their problems internally if they're willing to call up their, their minor league players, maybe a year early, maybe a couple months early, as most of those players I just mentioned are projected to be potential opening day roster positions next year. So I, I, I guess it's, it's fun. It's fun speculation. That's a, that's a very uh, conservative, I guess, approach where we're not giving away assets. We're just maximizing what we have in the system to, to potentially move forward. Of course, who knows what any of those players, when they get called up, what they'll actually do at the major league level. But I kind of like the idea of not, of not, uh, you know, trying to go for it, but not giving away, you know, anything of our pretty thin, admittedly, farm system. We can't afford to be trading away much of that for to get uh, like a short-term gain. So I don't know. You, you 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 see more supportive of my philosophy with the Tigers than than you than you. Yeah, do I Cubs, I think so. I think your philosophy with the Tigers, um of staying pat, standing pat can win the division. I don't think the Cubs can stand pat and win the division. I think they do have to trade. Yeah, I think you're um, right. And because they've proven right now that they can't win. The Tigers have been within three fucking games of this division l- recently. Yeah. And then they went on a little bad streak. And the difference is the Cubs are, I think the Cubs are pretty healthy. The Tigers just keep getting healthier. Yeah, and they're going to continue to get healthier, and you know the Tigers trade could be just going to run this by you. It's, it's like a it's 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 a little bit of a of a Sox philosophy sometimes, so you don't get like that big star player, but getting someone who's controllable, so they're not just for this year. They don't have to trade like a top star but get someone who's like mid-level, but could be a boost for the team. Yeah. Maybe one player offensively. I don't think they need to do that much because of the division they're in. Yeah. Uh, You know, so like, I don't know. I don't know why I fucking hate the Tigers, but I'm I'm also (laughs) like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest about it. And I look at them and I see their trend upward and I see them as a worrisome team next year for well i don't even know what the fuck the socks and we'll get to that in a few minutes yeah but but like they're a worrisome team if you're thinking of contending in the division next year because their trend is upwards the money that is coming off the books which is another reason probably not to do too much why tie yourself up when you're going to be able to be active in the free agent market next year why why trade something away when you're going to have money to fucking buy what you want next year and, and have those great talented young players there. So yeah, that, I get your are... philosophy. Your ph- philosophy is solid. I'm saying maybe there's a possibility to swing something, you know, that is, minor deal is, is that doesn't cost big deal. prospects. Yeah. That's a plus. And then you don't have to worry about maybe mentally, you know, moving someone up too early and then causing them like that mental stress of, oh, I didn't perform in the majors and then sends yeah. them in that downward spiral that happens sometimes. So I don't know. I mean, also, I if they don't do anything, if they just stand pat and do what you said, I think they can still win the fucking division. So that's, I mean, that, that's the that's my really conservative way to go. I think that that's very plausible. I, I don't think that they're going to win the division, even if they do everything I think they should do. I, I think it's it, it could be there, but 
I also think this is a this is a bonus year. This is Scott Harris's yeah. first year on the job. Just don't do anything to to fuck up the future. Um, yeah, like 100%. like you said. So yeah. I don't know. Every time I talk about the Tigers, I talk about it. all I really wanted out of the season is just entertain me, and they they are doing that, and they are certainly doing that this week. Uh, but they've done that throughout the season. They did not do that for even a month of last season. So no, I, they did I not. Appreciate appreciate what they're doing now and what Scott Harris is building. So don't fuck it up at this point. Uh, still with the Tigers, I do have a sticky finger, sticky balls. Whoa. To talk about, I don't know if you, I don't know if you saw this, uh, on Tuesday amongst all the, the crazy scores. Have you ever heard of Jordan Lyles? No. Well, there's a reason you've never heard of Jordan Lyles. Cause I've never heard of him either. He's, <laughs> right now he has a one and 11. No, I think he's. I don't know. He might still have a one and 11 record Oh, ERA around six. I think it might be six Oh five. Nice. Uh, for the Kansas city Royals. Well, Tigers fans know who he is and certainly Royals fans, but many others know who he is now because of a screenshot captured from the Kansas city broadcast during his masterful appearance against the Tigers uh, where he held them hit li- or scoreless with only three hits over six innings. Uh, very uncharacteristic of one Jordan Lyles, as I pointed out, his track record. There was a screenshot captured uh, with him raising his arms above his head, which exposed a his wrist, essentially. He was wearing long sleeves, and which is a, a little bit curious. I'm wondering if you've, if, have you ever been to Missouri? Yeah, I'm at, in fact, when I'm out for the week coming up, we're, we're, we are going to Missouri. We're going to Kansas city. Uh, we'll be, we might take in a Royals game on Friday night. Um, the, uh, high temperature has been in the hundreds there and, yeah. uh, it's, it's peaking at 98, I believe you're, on you're, Friday. You're taking me right where I wanted to go. Yes. Yeah. I've been yeah. to Missouri a couple it's times. It's a dry now. heat. No, I'm yeah. kidding. It's a uh, humid heat. The next question is, are you going to wear long sleeves if you go to the hat? I'll be Kansas lucky to have game. a shirt on. I'll be in that goddamn uh, the goddamn White Sox uh, <laughs> basketball jersey. For What's up, shirt off? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was curious. And you see other pitchers wear, wear long sleeves for whatever reason, even in high Keep heat. Keep their so arm loose. That is a that, common thing, yeah. That's not enough to indo- indict uh, Jordan Lyles of any wrongdoing, but it was curious, I guess, I guess you'd say. What was even more curious was an odd looking, I would say it looked like snot smeared snot on his exposed wrist from this screenshot that the whole world, whole world was able to see, but you would not be able to see underneath his long sleeves. The only reason they were exposed is because this picture had him raising it for whatever he was raising his hands over his head. Maybe he was raising the roof after his incredible start against the Tigers. But I'm sorry. You look at that. It's spider tack. It was, it's obvious. I mean, I'm going to be biased, but if you look at it, anyone with an objective eye would also agree. It's a foreign substance that he was clearly using for whatever reason. So uh, the, the funny part of it is after the game, uh, I think it was right after the game. Spencer Torkelson, the Tigers batter who I think he went 0 for, 0 for against him that night, who had previous success against him. He was he was specifically asked if he thought that Jordan Lyle would might be using some sticky substance. And he said, Of course he is. <laughs> this is happening everywhere. He was just fortunate not to get caught tonight. Caught by the umpires. He was caught on television, <laughs> at least. But yeah. Uh so that led to some consternation. It's like, can you really talk about this stuff in public? Like, should, is he going to get plunked for saying this? But if you look at, some people looked at the data then after the game, like Lyle's spin rate was up like 150 RPMs. And the lo- his pinpoint location is the thing that, that Tor- Torkelson pointed out, which Lyle's doesn't typically have. But he he never missed a pitch. Like everything was located perfectly that night. So that was, that's the anecdotal and uh, empirical evidence that that was presented against Jordan Lyle. So he, of course he's not being suspended. The the umpires 
did not catch him, but they're they're only checking hands and gloves as as I've seen it over the years. I don't and know how they wouldn't have felt it on his hands though. Well, that's what's curious. Does he puts it on his non-throwing hand wrist? So he touches. Does he touch his fingers to the sticky stuff? Yeah, you or have he to just, to get a grip. Or does he just put the ball on it? It's underneath his glove, essentially. So when he's putting the ball on his glove, does he does he scrape it up against oh, his wrist? But you still think it would get on your hand. I, well, I've never put. I, I've yeah, seen I don't know. I, I've, I've never done a. I don't have spider tacks. So, I've seen okay. other podcasts do the sticky stuff. Uh, test themselves we don't have the budget for that <laughs> it's, it's, we make no money off of this but uh i'd be curious to see how that really how that would really work that's my theory I, i'm just wondering i'm not if, saying I, I believe he was doing it obviously they caught it and it was an incredible performance but like i just yeah don't see how the umps wouldn't have I think some umps care more than others, to be honest, too. That plus, I think there might be a way he get, he could get it off of his fingers in time before mm. he's before he's judged, like a wipe on the way. leg or something. And... Yeah, I don't know. So I, I I guess just going forward, I would say let's look at uh, how many pitchers are pitching with long sleeves during these summer months, <laughs> and check out their wrists if that's if that's the new way that it's being done. Because I don't, I mean, Torkelson is a batter. And every batter is going to be paranoid that every pitcher is cheating against him because they have been for years. And now they're being, they're being told they can't. So he's looking for conspiracies against him. I think, I think any, any major league hitter would, would, would feel the same way or say similar things. So he's obviously biased, uh, but I don't know. I, I think it's, I think it's curious. Uh, I, I do believe sticky stuff is happening all the time. We're still seeing suspensions. And like you said, and a haphazard enforcement and difficult, uh, difficult to prove enforcement necessarily of the rules. So I don't know, just something to look for, look forward, uh, look for going forward uh, as this really confusing, almost impossible to, to enforce properly rule is continues to make headlines here and there. All right. That is it for my Tigers, finally, if you will, wanted to move over to your Chicago White Sox. Well, not really, but we will anyway. Yeah, you never want to anymore. I feel bad. Yeah. Well, uh, I think I'll start off with uh, we, we got a win today. We got a win today. In, you in, did. With, Congrats. Over the New York mess. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, that comes with a caveat. Yeah. Uh, we are, we're three and three, like the Cubs. It's a Chicago thing. We're three and three, like the Cubs. Somehow we went in and beat the team with the best record in baseball, two out of three in Atlanta. You, you got to talk more about that series that I don't understand what the fuck happened there. That, that, that I yeah. thought you'd be kind of flying high and into this uh, podcast. I, I was, know. I was not, I mean, I was like, mm. Oh wow. We managed to win two games in Atlanta. I don't believe where it. the fuck's and, this been all year. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then we, have Lucas, what we, we have game one of the Mets series. Lucas Giolito on the mound, who's been our, our most consistent pitcher all year, is getting shot. Impossible best trade commodity. Yeah. Well, he, he really did a great, great one, one. I should have one more outing, obviously, before that. But, you well, know, he gets shelled. Soon. He gets shelled by the Mets, which, you know, the Mets can hit, but they're not consistent. So, I mean, you would have thought Giolito could have got the better of them. Of course, the Mets are or the mess, as we like to say, are, are so bad that they, after having a nine to nothing lead, then making it 11 2, let the Sox come all the way back to 11 uh, 10. Um, and then Timmy with the runners on, who had a oh, run it up with a three for five night after he made the last out of the game, but he has, you know, showing life again. He's he's hit he's gotten hits in every game pretty much uh, except the one I think since the All Star break so he seems to be coming around but they lose eleven ten they get no offense the next night I think it was five to one but then today they get six to two um, they win six to two I mean everyone kind of participated it was one of those games and. Uh, one of my topics tonight was SOE, my new segment, same old Eloy, because of course, during 
the first Wait, series he it's like kind of like the same old lions so yeah is it, exactly is it SOE? it doesn't quite have the same ring to it it also doesn't doesn't like also so have the acronym of so yeah so so that like asian <laughs> yeah maybe he got injured running the first, of course. A common White Sox injury, by the way, running the first base. They get injured. I saw a lot. that. Is he still out? Or? No, well, that's what I was going to talk about. So okay, great. today you. he came back, went two for four with a run in an RBI. So ah. it, was, it was not the same old Eloy because normally the same old Eloy is he's run to first base, pulls a groin, and then is gone for like six weeks. But he was only gone for like three games, so three or four games. So, oh, good. What are you all? What are you all pissed off about? Let's back in the front upside down. The, the Sox win two or four. They're three and three out of the break, mirror to mediocrity. But the Sox are more like you know, the Sox are more like Billy Bean's uh, description of the Oakland the Oakland A's um, after every season because they have no money to buy a team. There's you know, like the teams on oh. top, the Yankees. Then there's the teams below that. Then there's 50 fucking feet of shit. And then there's the Oakland A's. And that's where the White Sox are right now. They're under the oh. 50 fucking feet of shit. 16 games below 500 still. They that's- are terrible. They are obviously sellers. They have one legitimate, like they have, they have, a, they have I mean, Jake Berger, 21 homers, 47 RBIs, pretty good Boy. season. Worth I coming think- out. I think I think everyone liked Jake Berger. I don't know if anyone saw this season coming. No, not uh, you know. I was one of the much like the Torkelson. Him, him and Gavin Sheets both get the Torkelson treatment. They had like four hundred at bats, and everyone was writing them fucking off that you know they yeah. weren't good enough players. They even had a season's worth of at bats even, and and while you know Gavin Sheets doesn't get enough consistent playing time to really get. Um, an idea of what he might be able to do. They don't really have consistent room for him because he's yeah. he's a minus outfielder, and obviously we have way too many first basemen. So, um, but you know, Berger is a reason. Like, if you're going to go to a White Sox game, but you know, Lewis Robert is a legit star. He he's, without a time, last he week. might be. You brought it up. He could maybe be the AL MVP. He, I think he'd easily be without Otani, but um, yeah, it's not going to happen. But you know, you wonder like, is he enough to to keep people coming to the ballpark? I, I have a feeling in September it's going to look like the Oakland A's uh, field out there, where you got like eight thousand people in the seats if you're lucky. But we'll see. Um, yeah, you. I did see a thing where you know attendance is up across all of baseball, but it is markedly down in 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 south side of chicago yeah which is like understandable like 6500 less per game than last year I, yeah something like that so it, that i mean yeah I, i'm not gonna blame white Sox fans for that but when you see attendance going up everywhere else it's, it's doubly frustrating yeah and what's what's also frustrating and annoying it's become annoying is you know just listening to pedro Grafal because mm. it's the same old thing and he has a catchphrase. Are you aware of his catchphrase? So, uh, sure. uh, being what, what is this? I, what, let, me, let me just pull up the Sox record so I can get this number right. So they're they have fifty seven losses. After they yeah, lose, they he says pretty much every post game. You know, we just got to flush it and come back tomorrow. So flush, oh, flush it. it. I yeah. have heard that. Yes. Yeah. We just got to flush it and come back tomorrow. So basically 57 times this year, we have heard that the Sox got to flush it. Well, I think it's about time to <laughs> flush the season. Flush. Rick Hahn. Oh, Kenny Williams. Because wow. I'm not, I, 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 I've lost complete confidence and I'm not going to blame Rick Hahn for Picking the players he picked in those trades, everyone thought well, they were every G. You, you, if you ask anyone, you even ask people this year, they said the white we we have confidence the White Sox are still going to win this division. That was back in May, because yeah. of the talent that is on the field. But it's not well, that talented. Well, you you actually beat me beat me to the punch again. I think it's twice on this podcast. I was actually going to have an impromptu asshole question. For you about Rick Hahn. And I was going to ask, 
first I was going to ask you, when does Rick Hahn get fired? And I think that, I think anyone that's paid attention to how the White Sox organization works is he's not, it might be, I don't see how uh, close to dying uh, Jerry Reinsdorf is going to, is going to flush the whole, the whole front office and start over again. I have a, I have a reason why Kenny will be there, but Rick may not. Okay. Well, that's, that's what I was going to say. What, when would you flush Rick Hahn? I would have flushed Rick and Kenny, but here's what I think is going to happen. I think Rick, Rick, Rick is said Pedro Grafal was his guy. Yeah. Rick also, in a not so direct way, facial expressions, lack of 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 full on support, was probably part of Tony La Russa leaving Jerry Reinsdorf's buddy. Rick mm. could possibly be on the hot seat for the first time in his career with the White Sox and Jerry Reinsdorf because. Oh. All right, you got your guy. You, your guy's Pedro Grafal. We got the team. It's your team. Yeah. It's 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 go time. And he's had eleven years as general manager. He is since that uh, twenty beginning of the twenty thirteen season. The White Sox are one hundred and thirty three games below five hundred. Yeah, including today, I, he's got to go. They have had one. They've had two. Winning seasons in that time. One division. You did win the division under Tony Arusa, believe it or not. Yeah. As 93 games. 93, 93 fucking games, too. That's not too shabby, actually. No, but uh, the that's the one round time. The playoffs was, was shabby, but. He's had 11 years, and you're in worse shape now than than ever, it feels like. So I, I could I could see why, why you've come to this conclusion. Yeah, I mean, this is. I'm curious why you think Kenny. This is this is kind of an an about face because for for that decade, any any move that I felt like White Sox fans disagreed with or thought was dumb was blamed on Kenny. But anything smart was was put on on Rick's plate, giving credit, giving Rick credit for it. So you're kind of doing doing about face. Well, I I don't of, of what I don't, I'm used to, I guess. But well, I don't think anything recently like like I don't think anything like Kenny Williams has been involved in. I feel like, when they, I feel like when they were no getting, idea. I know. I feel like when they were getting those like stupid veteran player trades, um, that felt like Kenny, it felt like things you've seen Kenny do. Yeah. I saw years. Kenny do when he was GM. So he was logic. He hadn't let up the reins and he was still very much in the press then. he is, he's, you barely know he's around at this point, really. Well, I mean, that's just because he doesn't talk. But I mean, that that doesn't mean he's not. Yeah, he's no, not I know. In every single decision. In uh, fact, Rick Hahn once said, you know, when people are trying to parse their words and find out who is really making decisions, he's like, "Look, look, guys, Kenny's my boss." He, he said that. It's almost like the the Godfather thing where they try to get the guy saying he's the boss. Uh, I forget how that worked out. Uh, it's almost like they caught him somehow saying that. So I don't know if he was trying to put responsibility on Kenny. I think he's intimately involved with every decision still. And yet Jerry can still overrule them both. Uh, obviously right. with the Tony La Russa situation. So it's, it's all nebulous. Uh, maybe by design, maybe by accident, maybe by uh, incompetence that that's the, that's how the power structure works. I don't, I don't know, but it's, it's clearly not functioning. Yeah, I mean, for me, I gave Rick more of a pass because of of Jerry and purse strings and, yeah. you know, not offering big contracts and, and shit like that. But Andrew Benatendi is the largest free agent contract you've ever signed. Yes, he has yes. one home run. Oh, he does one home run, but he's a fucking banger of a leadoff hitter, a hundred percent. Like he is, yeah. he is, he has more than filled the void that Timmy. Uh, presented. But the idea that so, the idea that he's he's your most expensive free yeah, agent. Yeah, I mean he's making one one million dollars more than 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 Tim this year. It is crazy when you think about it. Like it's yeah. it's fucking ridiculous. Why well, I, I think it's actually the largest contract just because of the years. Because the Sox yeah, never. You know, like a per is. year basis. Yeah, it's still ridiculous. Yeah. In a major market, it's fucking comical. 
that's, that's the, the thing. Like, the Sox are comical. It's just a comical that, approach to baseball. Major market is is the best the best way to phrase it because the, the Sox have never acted like a major market team, much like the Oakland A's never act like a major market team, even though yeah. the Bay Area is <laughs> incredibly major market. It's obvious what what's happening. So. I mean, where, does Oakland, when Oakland is good, do they sell out? Because here's the thing, like yeah. at the same time, if well, running, they sell out when they you... put tarps over the upper deck, <laughs> that was kind of the thing, but, but cause that's a, well, that's a football stadium. So, but like part of the reason the Sox don't function like a major market team, if you're running it like a business of, of, and we all know they're the owners are rich. So this is, I'm not, I'm just saying if you're, if you've got a business model that says you need to be pulling X in at the box office, X in in concessions, and we're going to invest X amount of money because they're all fucking greedy and that's what they do. So I'm just bringing the reality of the situation. The White Sox probably never fucking meet those numbers. And the fan base, even when they are good, they, I was, again, I'll, I'll just throw this out there. They were, they were, they were, when I bought season tickets, in 2005, I bought season tickets. They were available. I bought yeah. the whole second half of the year and had full season tickets for the next two years with, with, a, with a group of people, with, with, with two other people. And I was able to do that even though they had a 10-game lead, I think, at that point in the division, at least a seven-game lead in the division. No one was going There's... to the ballpark. I, I went and saw a Bobby Jenks come out of the bullpen for the first time against the Dodgers, I believe it was. And there's like 22,000 people there. So Here's another, here's another ask hole question along those same lines. Would people be showing up? Would, would it be difficult to get a season ticket if they had signed somebody like say Bryce Harper or Manny Machado? If they had brought in those stars that, that other teams have, that literally make they make their own salary because attendance rises that much and merchandise sales and everything else. They they get on the map. It's also not if they don't uh, win. They have to well, win, and then even when they do win, it's still not sellouts. It's like you know, it's it's like well, it was sold out in people. Yeah, it was sold out in two thousand six and, and seven. But I, well, six, I, yeah, seven was okay. a little bit up and down, but yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I just, I, I, that just popped into my head. No, that's, that's, other- that, that, that's a valid point. But like this, this fan base, even when they've had bigger names and different errors on the field, they still never sold out consistently. And, huh. and, Can- and when White Sox complain and they say, you know, and I, I've, I've been arguing this for, for, for years now on this podcast, like don't go to games. You already don't go to games. So mm-hmm. you're not going to, and we all know it doesn't make a difference anyway because of the collective bargaining. So, it, you know, but. But like you said, they, they have to win. And that, that's that's valid. I, I think I, I admire that. Well, it is valid. In, in but Sox then. Fans but your psyche, team but, on the. Sorry, go ahead. I apologize. Well, I was just I was just thinking, no, I mean. The. I've heard people talk about what part. The main reason the rebuild failed. It's because they didn't make that final move with a star to put them over the top. You you don't, you have local heroes. You do have, of course, Luis Robert, who's, who's an MVP candidate. But if you had the, the next level star, if you have multiple stars like that, instead of solid players here that are, are inconsistent, that I, I, I guess my argument, that argument would be, in two ways, you'd, you'd have star power to draw people out and you'd be winning more games. You would have completed the, the rebuild. Well, everything's well, a maybe, a, but well, it is a maybe look at the San Diego, look at San Diego and the New York Mets. They have $300 million plus payrolls. They and, have Manny yeah. Machado and, and the Padres. They can't fucking win shit. They also, yeah. And they have Fernando Tatis. So you could, you could argue that you, it doesn't even matter if they built through the system too. So, I guess it goes a lot of directions, but I don't know. I don't know how we're, I don't think we're going to solve the, the white Sox issues uh, on this podcast, but yeah, I yeah. just thought it was, it was interesting. Different, different ways. I've heard kind of the same argument, but they kind of dovetailed with the attendance versus winning versus the, the putting the final, t- 
touches on the rebuild with with a major star. Yeah, and you know, there's reports that they went after certain pitchers, not not necessarily position players with like, but uh, you know, they went <laughs> after certain certain pitchers who chose not to come here with equal offers. We all know the Machado offer was bullshit, but the the other offers they made, I can't remember the names of a couple of those pitchers, but it was like in the thirty million dollar a year range. So. I don't know. Like it is, it is what it is. We're just, the reality of the situation is Rick Hahn is ultimately to blame. He's also ultimately to blame for the managerial choice of Pedro Grafal and his flush it. And, and, and the reason you're annoyed, I'm annoyed about that is I thought Bruce Bochy was a legitimate candidate mm. and, look what he, and look what the fuck he's done. The That's Texas Rangers with essentially the same team because Jacob DeGrom in his normal fashion is out for the rest of the fucking year because he can't keep his arm uh, healthy. They were 68 and 94 last year. They have the same team. They have almost a 600 winning percentage right now and are leading the, the AL West with they a different spent, manager. They, all spent, they also spent outrageous amounts of money last year that didn't work out. Now it's working this year. But Bochi was the part that pushed him over the top. Clearly. That's what I'm saying. Those guys you all... have firsthand knowledge of his powers as being a yes. Giants fan all these years. So Yes, but we get Pedro Grafal because he's going to – he can speak the language of the players. What? Yeah, we should have talked about that a lot more before, before that decision was made because Bochi was out there. He was voicing – he made it very public that he he wanted to get back into baseball. Didn't it, did, wasn't he kind of pushed out of the Giants, or did he? No, I, I he said that, he said he was out. he said he was just kind of he wanted to take a break. You know, okay. I don't think he but, was. I don't see any reason why they would have pushed him out, but I don't know. But I just remember hearing for years before he did finally join the the Rangers that he he wanted to get back into baseball. So, yeah, you wonder how you know the revolving doors of history how how things would be different if, if Rick Hahn had a fancy for Bruce Bochy. Although at the time I could see people making the argument. We just had an old manager that didn't know what he was. That doing. was, I think that was the fucking argument was, but you had an old manager who was out of touch. Yeah. And, and he was Bochy, also 10 years out of the well, game. Bochi yeah. was not out for that long. So. And Bro- Bochi also is younger than La Russa too, I think by like 10 years. But he's in his Oh, is it that much? Yeah, okay. I think so. Or maybe maybe it's only like four or five years. But he's yeah. definitely a little bit younger than La Russa. So it's like, you know, that's, that's again, that's on Rick Hahn. He got his guy, Pedro Grafal. I'm not saying Pedro Grafal, like, yeah, he says all the right things, and if the coaching staff's doing what 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 has been projected, then it is on the players. I mean, the players are not doing well, what's thing. being asked of them, which is what we talked about last week. Like, you know, is it the players? Is it the manager? I don't know, but this is what I will say: you had a sixty-eight and ninety-four team with star players. A lot of players there, yeah. I think you've got now a lot of players 50, on this roster. Yes, we do. Underperforming. So. Right. We got 58 and 39 right now. Run, you're dominating the AL West. Probably going to keep the Astros at bay. I mean, that's insane. Yeah, that's that's going to be – God, I hate both those teams, and I'm, I'm going to find that division race interesting to watch going down the stretch here. So Yeah. But before we leave this miserable ball club – We're going to do part two of the White Sox window has closed segment and the trade deadline. And part two is what's the pitching staff going to look like after the beginning? Was that August 2nd is the deadline or August 1st? August 1st is the deadline. So what's the, what's the pitching rotation going to look like on August 2nd? And Mm. here's what I originally wrote down. Now I'm going to make some caveats to it, but it was this cease Kopech. TBD, TBD, TBD. <laughs> Ouch. Wow. So you were losing Giolito, Lance Lynn. And, and Clevenger. Oh, Clevenger. But here's, he... the, here's the conundrum with Clevenger right now. He hasn't come back. Right. To Is pick. he scheduled to be coming back soon? Or what, well, he's, what's he's, the prognosis? Well, now he's throwing. He threw 45 pitches. He's going to throw 60 pitches. 
Can they off, get him a start off the mound? Off yeah. Of, they, yeah, he's got to do they a get him rehab a, start still, doesn't he? I mean, or have will do... they risk just throwing him out on the field and getting him a start to try to showcase him to get a trade out of him? I think that would be reckless. <laughs> I think that would be really that dangerous. sounds about right, though, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, that'd be very desperate. Because at the um, same time, what, do you, what are you going to lose? If you send him down for a rehab start, you're not gonna. He's not gonna have any trade value because no one's gonna know what he looks like against major league talent coming off the injury. I think even if he got one start in and it was incredible, I think people would be a little bit reluctant to to make any trade of any value. I think that's. I think this. He needed to come back right at the start of the right after the break he needed to pitch this week essentially yeah so that's where my that's where my head was at too so now i've changed my starting rotation actually has four pitchers in it it's got cease Kopech, clevenger and T- the newly signed tiki tucson to who oh pitched that's right in yesterday's ball game isn't the best but who fucking cares at this point you at least got a pitcher so we only have one tbd spot so right now i'm saying lynn and giolito are gone Giolito not helping his trade value by shitting the bed, but it's one yeah. start. You look at the, you look at the, at yeah, the, I don't at think the bigger it, picture in that. It's not great, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna cost you yeah. multiple prospects because he, he had one bad start. So then you got Kendall Graveman probably going. Joe yeah. Kelly comes back tomorrow. He's not gonna have as great of trade value because he's been on the IL a couple times. So, he, so looked, gonna, he looked like the biggest trade commodity for a while. He was having yeah. a pretty damn good year, and then he gets hurt. So, but a that's huge, frustrating. A huge trade commodity because he's been like really consistently good is Kenyon Middleton, who they signed hmm. for only seven hundred k for this season, and and he's pitched really really well. He's gonna bring an okay return. I mean, he's not a major name, so he's not gonna bring right. a huge return, but he's someone. So. I'm looking at the White Sox pitching staff is going to be gutted with five pitchers for sure leaving. Wow. Maybe, maybe a six, maybe, maybe someone's interested in a left-handed arm and Aaron Bummer just brings something back. Anything. I would, I would take anything for Aaron Bummer. They could get, he's got got years left on his deal. Doesn't he? Yeah. That's the beauty of it. So I don't know, maybe, maybe someone thinks they can work with that. He, I mean, he does, when you do look, when you do look at him statistically from, he has, uh, I think he, he used to have the highest uh, in the, but he's in the top like three in ground ball ratio and soft contact of left-handed relievers. Okay. So there's something to work with there. He might be another guy who just wants the fuck out of this thing. I mean, look at what he, he's been through every incarnation of this team I feel like and has yeah. never barely has, has seen winning. So, so yeah, we'll see. But I, I think the, the pitching staff is, is gutted for sure. And next week I wanted to spend in part three, the final part of this trilogy of what, what possible offensive players could be leaving. I don't want to spoil your part three, but I did see an article. I think it was in the athletic. Yeah, it was the athletic speculating that the Sox might put together a package deal. <laughs> You're going to love this. Tim Anderson, Lucas Giolito and Kendall Graveman to the Dodgers for one of their two best catcher prospects, their best second base prospect and a couple other things. I forgot what it was, but I'm okay with that. Phil- it would fill some needs. I'll send you that. I should have sent that before the show, but or maybe that dovetails nicely with your. It's part a three. It, it's a preview. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Smitty. You Wonderful that. setup. Yeah. I'll, I'll write your I'll write your segments for you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Actually, I think I mean, it was Jim Bowden that was supposing it. So I'm not. Well, that's Jim. Not sure at, least how, it, at least it wasn't uh, Bob. So yeah, definitely not Nightingale. I don't. I I rarely reference USA Today for this shit. So I, I tend to lean towards the athletic and ESPN, although ESPN is a little bit questionable these days, but do you hear, by the way, did you hear about Jeff Passan? No, he broke his back last week. He he actually lives in Kansas city, which I had no idea, but 
he was cleaning cleaning storm damage in his backyard and a tree limb fell on him oh fractured, my God. A, fractured a vertebrae so he is going to be covering the mlb trade deadline uh, from his bed i guess on painkillers and he was actually joking about that he's like yeah late night oh. tweets for me could be really interesting and a lot of painkillers like Holy breaking shit. news left and right so he's I, he's gonna be okay clearly but i couldn't believe that passing Passons broke his back, but he's still going to be reporting all the news for us over the next couple of weeks. So crazy. He's a trooper. Yeah, he is. He's dedicated, man. Love it. Well, let's get to something a little more fun. Yeah, we're going to move over to our badass of the week. Badass of the week time. This is actually a short one. This is the first time in, I feel like, several weeks that we don't have Luis Robert Jr. as a nominee. Although he would have been in the, the second tier if it hadn't been for the performances of this top tier he, he would have been in the mix but just didn't quite make it to to the ultimate level that we're going to now, i think if he had a home run today he may have been in the conversation he would have it wouldn't have taken much yeah just one more home run because he did steal a base again today that's two stolen bases over this yeah we don't value stolen bases enough or maybe they're not enough being stolen but I, we, we've mentioned it from time to time in, in the yeah. badass conversation but yeah maybe we need to put more of an emphasis on that uh all right here we go Are you ready I'm ready. We got Kerry Carpenter. I'm starting at the bottom. Three home runs, five runs, eight RBIs, and nine nine seven OPS. His OPS was over a thousand until his last at bat this afternoon. I was crestfallen. Oh. I saw it drop below a thousand when I had to send you that send you the updated numbers. He sucks. He had his <laughs> he basically had a great weekend in, in Seattle. That's where all those numbers are based. He didn't do a whole lot in Kansas City this week. So um Cody Bellinger, the what I will call trade asset for the mm. Cubs. Three home runs, eight RBI, six ribbies, and a 1291 OPS. Very good, Mr. Bellinger. The funny th- funny thing is that he's got six RBIs, but he had a grand slam this week. So <laughs> uh, RBIs, well. everything else, there was nobody on with his two other home runs, and that was it. So Very I thought good. he was gonna be our kind of our go run a runaway winner of this week's badass of the week award but he's kind of blown out of the water by our, our winner that you're gonna recite the numbers of right now yeah one uh of course he's from the best team in this podcast the Clearly. san francisco giants wilmer flores four homers seven runs seven rbis and a lewis robert like 1486 ops <laughs> yeah he had a home run today that's what definitely put him yeah on I think you sent me his numbers this morning and they, I did. they even exploded they from that this afternoon. So yeah, hey, why not? Like 200 in OPS it went up because I think it was like 1246 earlier. Jesus. Congratulations. Yeah. So our badass yeah. of the week, I believe, is Wilmer Flores. Yeah, we didn't even have to debate this. I just sent the yeah. list. It was it was obvious. I could have made a longer list, but it would have been yeah, no pictures this week, guys. Our, our pictures eh, like seven innings, but no one had like any lights out performances. Yeah, I feel bad because earlier in the year we I forget who it was had a, a nine inning shutout and we didn't we didn't give them the badass of the week. So we, we gotta figure out a way to get pitchers more into the mix here. Maybe maybe I'll i I'll look at uh two two consecutive starts or I don't know how to do this, but I and I have no idea how to put relievers in it other than like save opportunities. They got six saves in a in a seven game span. <laughs> I don't know how that would work, but a little bit repetitive but i do i do like that we're getting new names into this rather than just luis robert every week so well uh, he'll be back next week don't worry yeah i wouldn't be surprised but i'm happy <laughs> to make wilmer flores our, our <laughs> <best>. <laughs> not their asshole of the week no definitely not our asshole of the week we were talking about that before the show started we haven't had an asshole of the week in a while which is maybe that's a good maybe that's good news maybe baseball's in a good place that we maybe. don't have to report about assholes of the week every single week yeah. Although we could talk about uh, Rob Manfred uh, most likely being reelected as the owner's lawyer, as I refuse to call him by his real title. Uh, that shouldn't be surprising because he is making them lots of money and taking all the slings and arrows the owners don't want to deal with by being Go just Rob. a terrible person and, and an easy target. And I'm tired of coming up with different ways to call him an asshole. So it's going to be hard to make him an asshole the week ever again. Somehow he's probably going to find a way. So look forward to that. If that is it, should we wrap up this episode? All right. Well, 
this was this is a fun one. This is a little bit different. I thought this was gonna be a short one. This ended up being pretty pretty average length. So, congrats right. to us. Well, kind of your you know ridiculous feelings about the Cubs and <laughs> not giving and not and not feeling more excited about your Tigers. I mean, I had, a, I had to tell you how you should feel about your teams. Again, we find new new and creative ways to mischaracterize my <laughs> arguments, but I, I appreciate it. <laughs> With that. <laughs> You can find us on the web at majorleagueaholes.com and SoxTypeThing.com. You can find Pete on Twitter at SoxTypeThing, me at Major League A-Holes. You can find us all over social media at Major League A-Holes, including YouTube. And you can find this podcast anywhere you'd like to find a podcast. So with that, I think we can declare this podcast is over. Peace. Peace. Word Hole Media.